All right, 7.34 and 33 seconds. <laughs> I, th I think you're good to go. Okay, sounds good. All right. Um, well, as a matter of housekeeping, if you would kindly um, mute yourself unless you have a question, please feel free to chime in um, with questions at any point. Um, if you do, if you would kindly uh, let me know who you are and which office you're from, if you're comfortable sharing that. Um, this presentation is being recorded for anyone who may want to view it later. Um, I'll put it up on my YouTube channel so you can see it. Um, I think most of your questions will probably be answered through the course of the presentation. I've done this a few times. Um, but if we get to the end or if you feel the, the need to an ask a question, please let me know. Um, so we had our Cavo OP3D Pro CBCT machine installed in November of last year. We've had it for a little bit. We were fortunate to get on the early adopters list um, and it's been really great. Um, the purpose of the discussion today of this webinar today is to kind of talk about what to think about when you're getting started, um, preparation and how you can best utilize um, the machine in your office. Because for me, it's really dramatically changed how I practice dentistry. Um, and I think many people would say the same. So um, let's talk a little bit about our purpose here. Uh, this is just a screenshot from DTX Studio Diagnose. Um, you know, as we move through the presentation, hopefully you'll, you'll take the information that I'm gonna provide um, and utilize it uh, in a way that fits your practice. You know, there's really no one size fits all solution here. Your, um, but if you would find a way uh, to assimilate the information into your clinical culture, that'd be fantastic. Um, one other reminder, if you'd all kindly mute yourselves, um, I can go in there and do it, but I have to exit the presentation. So it's a lot easier just to hit mute unless you have a question. Okay, so some of you are on the fast track to get a, a machine. Others maybe a little bit of time before you do that. There's some things to consider, not the least of which is the cost. Um, but when you evaluate the cost versus the return um, that it may potentially provide from the standpoint of treatment diagnosed, um, and also patients uh, being willing to accept treatment because they can see what's going on, uh, it's really a no brainer if your office is in a relatively stable financial position. Um, so work with your regional partner and your regional manager to determine what timing looks like for you. But I would encourage you to try to move into the 3D um, imaging as soon as possible. So a couple of things to consider. This is what our machine looks like. This is a wide angle picture, so it's a little distorted. We have the Ceph attachment. Um, right where it sits now is where our previous uh, panel used to sit. So that panel right now is across the hallway from this operatory, this room in the other room. Um, I would suggest if I were to have it to do all over again, um, I would not have got the Ceph because we had a Ceph attachment on our other panel that would have saved us some money and the, the Ceph worked just fine. I would not have got the Ceph attachment and I would have left the panel, the original panel with the Ceph attachment in the room that it was in. And I would have taken the new machine, put it in the smaller x-ray room at an angle coming out of the corner just because it's so big. Um, so that's a, just a suggestion. Now this works fine. We don't have any issues with it. Um, but in the end, if I could have saved, you know, eight or 12,000 bucks without the, the Ceph attachment um, and then save the guys from having to move the panos and all that stuff, it would have been a little bit easier. So food for thought, if you want any input or have any questions, please let me know. Um, I want to draw your attention to some resources that we have. There, there is so much data out there that PDS has put together, Dr. Pham and Joe Feldstein and the CBCT team. There is tons of data out there. Um, and I would encourage you Here's a link, um, and you can get to it from the, you know, from the landing page, the, the PacDen PDS Connect landing page. You go to clinical, there's a CBCT, and it takes you right here. So I would encourage you to review this information. There's some getting started information. There's a whole bunch of training. A, a lot of what we're going to talk about um, is discussed in great detail in the training that I'm, I'm referring you to here. So I'd encourage you to take some time and, and at least explore this page um, and see what you can do to, to prepare yourself a little bit more in, uh, you know, in, in, ahead of getting the machine. So one of the main questions we always get um, is, well, what about the radiation dosing? You know, I'm used to taking a panoramic and an FMX. Isn't the CBCT a tremendous amount of radiation? Um, the short answer is the newer versions, no. Now this, is, this slide is meant to be kind of overkill. Um, we'll talk about these two pictures over here on the right on the next slide. Um, but radiation dosing is incredibly complicated. We're, when, we're, when we're calculating the actual dose versus the effective dose, you know, the absorbed dose, um, it's, it's different. So 
let's go to these two pictures here. Um, this is, take, comes directly from the CAVO um, manufacturer's website and also is on the, the PDS CBCT uh, landing page that I just showed you. This talks about the size of the image and the relative dose. And, you know, so this is your, your um, absorbed dose. Uh, I think it's milligrays per square centimeter. Um, this is the machine that I have. It's the 8 by 15. And we generally are doing the high resolution scan, which I'll explain here in a minute. Um, but the standard resolution scan, if you take a scan, standard CBCT um, with a set of bite wings and photos, you're exposing the patient to less radiation than you would if you're taking an FMX and a pano. So it's amazing to me how, how much lower the newer, radi the newer machines are uh, from the standpoint of, of radiation and dosing. So don't let that be a barrier to you to move into CBCT. It's really a no-brainer when we consider how little radiation it is. So depending on your machine, um, depending on your films, you know, and depending on whether you have a Schick Elite or a Schick 33 or the, the phosphor plates or F-speed film or whatever it is, these are kind of averages, a Pano 36. We can get into the, the high 20s with some of the newer machines, brand new machines and FMX. And these are micro sieverts. So this is effective dose compared to absorbed dose. Um, but when you consider a full scan on standard resolution, which works just fine, 52 micro sieverts plus a set of bite wings, which is three or four, you know, we're essentially the same. I mean, there really is no difference. Um, now, if you're adding a bunch of PAs, if you're adding additional x-rays because your assistants don't take them very well, then you're going to be higher than this, 51 microsieverts. So really, the, the dose um, that comes from a CBCT um, is minimal, minimally more, um, if not significantly less if you're retaking x-rays. And the benefit, not only to us as clinicians, but also to the patients and the diagnostic capability that we have, um, it's kind of a no-brainer. So I, again, I wouldn't let the radiation dosing be a barrier. So long as we're utilizing appropriate radiation protocols, you know, covering the patient and using as little radiation as possible, um, this shouldn't get in the way of you moving into the 3D um, x-ray machine. Okay, so next big question, what about my liability? I'm a general dentist, right? What kind of liability do I have? Well, honestly, if you're using it the way a dentist would use it, um, and you're identifying anything that might be a concern uh, and sending it up to someone who may have more information like beam readers, which is all on that landing page that we talked about, um, then your liability really, there's no difference in the liability you'd have from a Pano and an FMX versus a CBCT. Assuming if you see something that looks even slightly out of the ordinary, send it up to beam readers. And we'll talk about that here in just a second. Um, but again, all of this stuff is online. Um, this is something that the legal team put together um, for all of us to refer to. Uh, and I, I'll just draw your attention to this statement here. A dentist is more likely to get sued for failure to take a CBCT before performing, cer before performing certain dental procedures than being exposed to a potential claim for failing to diagnose some remote area that could not be seen on a CBCT. So, of course, when we're talking about dental implants, even third molars now, this is becoming the standard of care because it's so ubiquitous. This 3D imaging modality is out there. And so we really are finally starting to get to the very, very cutting edge with everybody having it. Um, but all this stuff is online. Okay, and here's another a picture of that CBCT homepage. That's Dr. Perpich. Um, this is what I was mentioning, Beam Readers. So Beam Readers is a company that we have partnered with, and these are oral and maxillofacial radiologists who all they do is analyze and evaluate 3D x-rays. So when the time comes, when you get your office set up, go to the CBCT homepage by going to the you know, PDS Connect, click on link, uh, clinical, click on CBCT, it'll take you right here. And then make sure you get your office set up for beam readers. And basically what that is, is you'll set up an account, um, you'll get three free scans. So if you have a CBCT come through and something doesn't look right, or you just want some more input, then you upload the, the DICOM file, which is the CBCT image file, and Beam Readers, this team of oral and maxillofacial radiologists, will look through it for you. Um, they'll identify anything you want them to, and you, you click through a bunch of links on the web page to tell them what to identify. And then they'll give you a nice report. Sometimes that report is this patient needs a biopsy, and I'll show you uh, one of those reports um, that I've got here in a little bit. Sometimes the 
the report is, which I get all the time, oh, that's normal sinus variation. <laughs> so it's okay to overassume. Um, that's why we have them. Um, that's why we have them to be able to draw on. So don't hesitate to use these resources. Uh, and like I said before, take the time to evaluate this. One of the most important and helpful resources that's been put together is this CBCT workflow sheet. Um, this is really well put together. And you know, as I as I've started using the CBCT in my office, I refer to this all the time. We'll dig into this page two a little bit more later. But if you look at this, you can click on this. It'll take you right there. If you look at the uh, uh, the actual flowchart, it's got clickable links, and these are to videos. These are training videos. And you know, back on the CBCT webpage, you can go to the PDSU, and there are probably there's probably hundreds, plural but if not at least 100 training videos that you have access to to help you learn and assimilate the knowledge to evaluate and read through these 3Ds. Many of us just don't quite, um, you know, we don't feel comfortable starting in with this 3D modality unless we have some advanced training. But really, they're providing a great introduction for us. So you don't have to be too concerned if you do your homework. And that's one thing, make sure you do your homework. If you can, you know, before you invest in this 50 or 60 or $70,000 machine in your office, make sure that your office is prepared. Make sure that your assistants and your front office team have done their homework so that you can hit the ground running rather than hit the ground falling on your face. How do we use this machine again? Um, you'll get some training, you know, a day of onsite training from a, uh, a trainer who should know what they're doing and can, can stay there and provide good feedback. But if you do your homework in advance, not only getting comfortable with you know the processes involved but also uh, how to review the x-rays through the imaging software dtx studio um, that'd be great and there are plenty there are when they install dtx studio ahead of your install date when they install it on all your computers um, you'll have practice files there are test files that'll come pre-installed and you'll have plenty of opportunities to to play with the the software Okay, so I'm gonna take you now to, we've got the machine installed, we've done some homework, we have kind of a basic understanding of how things work. Um, how do we order them? So CBCT images come in different flavors. Um, basically, there, there's a size component and there's a resolution component. Um, this is a referral form that uh, we have in our office. And initially, when we first got this installed, maybe for two or three months, every patient that came in the office, we had one of these attached to their their clipboard. So it was their route slip and it was this and their specialty referral form. Um, so all those were attached to the clipboard and the doctor would fill this out uh, after we did the meet and greet um, or when the assistant came and asked us what kind of x-rays they wanted. Um, so there are four sizes that I can order with my machine. Now your machine may, may be different. I have a KV OP 3D Pro which has the 8 by 15 size. Some of you don't. And to be honest, you can live without the 15. The 8x8 gives you plenty of resolution, plenty of size for what we need to do. The reason I extended to the 8x15 is I want to be able to see the TMJs. Um, so these are the four sizes. This is, a, of course, a very limited. And you can get four or five, maybe six teeth, um, a little 5x5 five five cube. Um, generally, most dental CBCTs are this size 8x8, eight eight, which gives you upper and lower maxilla mandible. Um, cuts off, you know, the 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 jaws, um, the ramus, and all that stuff. But you can see dentally wise exactly what you need to see. Um, and then of course, this guy's the big one. You can see in the TM, TMJs, there is a 13 by 15 that uh, Cavo makes as well, which would take you up above the orbits. Um, I don't know that I need to see the eyeballs as a general dentist, um, but some oral and maxillofacial surgeons would. Uh, so field of view, and, and, and as we're filling this out, we're basically uh, telling the assistant what kind of x-ray to take. And I'll walk you through that setup process here too in a little bit. Um, standard resolution, this is the one that I quoted as far as radiation is concerned, 52 microsieverts or 51. Um, we normally are taking a high resolution, which is in the 70s for me. Um, and personally, I still feel like that's justified and very diagnostic. It gives you a little cl more clear image. Um, it's just like a, I don't know, it's like a chic uh, elite versus a Schick 33, if any of you have experienced that. 
the Schick 33 is just so much clearer than the Schick Elite sensor, and the, the high resolution is is as well. So if you're looking at really evaluating nuance around it, you know root tips and stuff, go for the high. If you've got an endodontic diagnosis that you're questioning, use this endo mode. It's a smaller field of view. You only get it with the five by five, um, but the endo mode will give you an ultra clear image, assuming the patient was was holding still and they, uh, the assistant set it up right, which is a challenge sometimes. Um, make sure there's a signature on here, your name and signature. Um, many of you, you'll have uh, outside dentists or PDS dentists referring to your office if you're one of the first in the area to get a 3D. Um, it's critical if we're taking the x-ray for another doc that I have it documented that a different doctor ordered it, so I'm not liable to diagnose, to evaluate and read that. Now the, the patient, they usually, when we, you know, they come from an office down the street, they want a 3D, they, they want me to look at it for them. And I'm, I'm okay with looking at it. And I'll say, yeah, that looks like you have a root fracture. I'll let Dr. So-and-so know. Um, but ultimately the ordering doctor is the one that's liable for the diagnosis. So you have to have their signature here, not an OM signature, a BC signature, make sure they sign it and fax it or email it over. Okay. Let's see. Like we have a question. As far as payment, a new patient would do this inclusive in their exam, similar to FMX and Pano. NPX needs OS. We wouldn't retake the CBC, so wouldn't it be an extra charge? Um, I never charge patients extra um, for a CBCT. Uh, the, this is all on the, the page and it's based on region. Uh, we normally charge for an outside patient $100. Um, honestly, I would, I would encourage you not to, to look at the CBCT itself as a means of income, although we should be charging a reasonable fee for it. Um, instead, uh, look at the information it provides you as the opportunity to recoup that cost. So, and I'll talk a little bit about it as well. If you have a patient that comes in, um, that comes in and they're a new patient, there's some need for OS or some need for ortho. If you take the CBCT, we now also have a panoramic, we now also have a CEPH from the 3D, so there's no need to take additional x-rays. You can also section and create PAs if you need one for insurance. So when I order x-rays for my new patients, I order a full scan 3D, high res, eight by 15, it shows me everything you know in this area. And I also order a set of bite wings and photos. Um, and from that, I can see a lot more than I could from PAs. And we'll, we'll, show, we'll show you some of those there. But yeah, that's a good question. <clears throat> So sending a CBCT from DTX to outside referrals. So it's really actually pretty simple. And, and there is a link on that, uh, that CBCT webpage. You have to make sure you export it not to the USB. You have to export it to the desktop or to documents and then move it to USB. For some reason in the export process, it, it gets hung up in the transfer to the USB. I don't know what the process looks like. But if you're exporting from your 3D x-ray machine, which is super high powered, uh, it'll take, you know, so you go into DTX and you click on share and full patient and or the the data and the the whole x-ray image, deselect anonymize so that the patient's name is labeled there. When you export that, um, export it to the desktop of the computer and then move it to the to the USB. We haven't had any issues once I figured that out. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about acquiring an image. So you have the x-ray ordered, um, you've got a signature on it, whether it's yours or the doctor that, re that uh, requested it. Um, you have to pull the patient up at the computer, which is ours is sitting over here on this countertop to the right of the screen. Um, once the patient is set up in the computer, pulled up through DTX Diagnose, and there's a little Ceph button if you're still using CPS like we are, a Ceph button you click on that will actually open the DTX Studio. Once that's open and the patient's selected, now this touch screen becomes active. At that point, you have to enter the size, and you can see right here there are four sizes, um, and you have to enter the other exposure factors. All right. So exposure setup, um, you're basically it's a touch screen. Now the pano, there's pano here, 3D, Ceph, and that's for uh, training or something like that. I, I think maybe it just says Cabo. Yeah. So if you're taking a pano, you'll select the pano, and we can take conventional panos with this machine. We, uh, I don't take 3Ds on anyone younger than 18 unless there's some justification. Um, it's, 
to me, a, a child or an adolescent doesn't need that radiation dose, again, unless there's justification. So we'll, we'll still take panoramics periodically with this machine. But I also have my other panoramic in the room opposite this room. Uh, we didn't get rid of it. And I would encourage you, if you have a working panel with, a, with or without a staff, don't get rid of it. Keep it. We use it so often, especially when we have OS that wants to check an implant position or a perio that does the same thing or our orthodontist that, that wants a you know, panoramic. So once you've got the patient set up in the computer, you've got the exposure settings entered here and be cognizant of, cognizant of the patient size. Um, it's all about head size. They'll train you. It doesn't, body size is irrelevant. It's all about the size of the head when you're setting them up. Um, make sure before the patient stands up that you cycle the machine. There's a little return button kind of like you're used to with the panoramic machine. So the machine will put itself in the right position. And this is our sensor, which is movable. It goes over to the other side, the Ceph side. Um, if our orthodontic team is here, there's a lot of movement that the machine has to go through to go from the Ceph setup to the 3D setup. So if you have a patient in there and you hit cycle, then suddenly the machine's moving around them and it's really awkward. So make sure you get the machine completely cycled and wait for the lights to turn on, the laser lights, before you move the, the patient into the machine. Um, so get the laser lights on. At that point, I would put the x-ray on the, the apron on the patient. And then you have to explain to them a little bit. Depending on the, the exposure that you're going to take, whether it's a full exposure or whether it's a limited, um, you want to make sure that they're aware this is going to take two cycles. Um, when you're first starting, you're always going to take a scout scan. Always, always, always. That's a pre-scan to make sure you're in the right position. Once you've got a month or two in and you're comfortable with your assistance, then you can stop taking that scout scan. But I would always, always, always take a scout scan. Um, so tell them, once I get you in position, the most critical thing is for you to hold still and don't move. So if you're uncomfortable, if you feel like you're shaking, we need to adjust the machine. Now you'll notice we started having a chair in place. Um, our problem was this, there's not a whole lot of room for that chair to slide in. We eventually, most of the time, unless a patient's really old and has a hard time standing still, we do this standing up. But you'll find a way that works best for you. Um, the key though, is to prepare the patient that the, the absolute most important piece of the puzzle is that they hold still because movement creates all this interesting scatter which gets in the way of our diagnosis. Um, okay, patient preparation, patient positioning. So now that we've got the lights on, you, you walk the patient up so they're just in front of the machine, but not in the machine. So they're in front of the machine and you can see the lights on their face. Um, at that point, you can adjust the machine, the whole carriage that you see here, this whole carriage, you can move it up and down to where the lights need to be. Um, one of the problems you'll experience probably if you haven't already is the assistants are so used to taking panos that they're trying to get one of the lines to match the Frankfurt horizontal plane. And it usually does, the top line, but if you're taking a limited field of view, they're going to miss it every single time. So it's a totally different mindset for the assistants and it takes some training. And that's why the scout scan is so important. Um, so position the patient or position the machine to match the patient's height. We don't want the patient going in and trying to match the machine height because now they're in an uncomfortable position and they're going to shake, right? So you've got the laser lights on. If they turn off, there's a little light button. You turn them back on, have the patient stand just back from the machine, get the lights lined up. Um, sometimes the lights are in the right place, but now the chin rest is too low. So then you move the chin rest up to match the patient's chin height and have them come in so it's a natural height. Then I have them hold on to these little handles and take a half step forward so they're just leaning back a little bit. And that moves the shoulders down. If they're leaning back, it gets the shoulders out of the way. Sometimes you've actually got to get, you know, some of us have big shoulders. You actually need to get us to cross our, our arms and hold on to the opposite side handle to get those shoulders out of the way. But most of us, you know, most patients are fine just holding on to each of the little handles. Okay, then you acquire the image. Now, we were trained to put a bunch of cotton in there, you know, cotton rolls everywhere, all over the place um, to get a nice distinction. Um, for me, that always just got in the way. And it's really awkward for patients with a mouthful of cotton, you know, to stand there in the machine. So I, I haven't taken, I haven't put any cotton in patients' mouths in, I don't know, four or five months. I don't see the need anymore. Um, actually, the, the tissue, the space, the teeth, you know, all that differentiation isn't helpful to me anymore. Um, I just, I leave the cotton out and have them bite together gently, right? But not clench, because clenching gets all the muscle movements. Just have them bite together gently. Again, we're trying to, we're going for, 
a solid stable position. We don't want a whole bunch of movement. Okay, then the image acquires. Again, the scout scan. Once you do the scout scan, it's real quick. Continue to hold that button, the exposure button, until the machine cycles back to where it started, right? You don't want to just stop it halfway. So it, it'll expose and then it'll go back to where it started. Then you evaluate the scout scan. If you need to move the patient or if you need to move the machine, do it then and then take the full exposure, excuse me, which takes about twice as long. It's about 20 seconds, maybe as much as 30 seconds if I recall right. Um, and then it takes a while for the machine to, to process. With a high res a CBCT image, it could take three to five minutes for that machine to kick the image for the uh, OP machine to kick the image back to the computer. So what my assistants have started doing is they will start by taking the CBCT and while the image is being processed, they'll minimize, not close, but minimize DTX and go in and take their bite wings and all their photos to make the best use of their time. Um, once that image pops up, um, just make sure you hit OK or save or next or finish, whatever the appropriate dialog um, box is and then move forward. Um, it should be noted that the images can only be open in one computer at a time. So if you, like me, like to open up the 3D images in the hallway computer and evaluate how things are looking before you go into the room, make sure that you save it, close it uh, before you open it up in the other room. And sometimes the assistants get really gung-ho and they try to open it up before you get to it. They'll open it up in the operatory and then you can't open it. So I would encourage you to tell them, just open DTX, don't open it in diagnose because um, there are two versions of DTX. There's the DTX Studio, which manages all of the program files. And then there's DTX Diagnose, which actually opens the image file. Okay, we've spent too much time on this slide. <laughs> so here's the, um, here's the uh, touchpad. Um, you'll notice, you know, we've got the size here and we've got the positioning. If you select a smaller field of view, this becomes really critical. You'll touch that and then you'll be able to move it around the mouth but be very aware of the sides, left versus right. It's different um, than what you're used to. Um, so you're basically looking down through the patient's head like you're looking straight down at them. So left is actually left and right is actually right, as opposed to what we're used to looking at on the x-ray, okay? So just pay attention to the left and right and make sure um, before you take a limited field of view that this little blue cylinder that you see is in the right position. Um, this blue cylinder moves up and down as the chin rest moves up and down. So like I said before, you have to position the lights on the patient where you want them and then move the chin rest up and down to match the chin height before the patient goes into the machine. That's a key that it took us a while to figure out. So get those lights on, adjust the whole entire carriage up or down with this button here, right here. <clears throat> then adjust the chin rest up and down uh, to match the patient's chin height, but only after the lights are where you need them to be. And the lights indicate the upper and lower borders of the exposure area. So you've got a bottom border and an upper border. I normally try to center the occlusal plane right in the middle. So sometimes we miss a little bit of the chin, which is fine. Um, the most common error is to have it too low and we miss all of the maxillary sinuses. So try to center the, the occlusal plane in the cylinder. Um, now, if you're taking a limited field of view, it's a little bit different. Okay, so let me move this a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about image filters. So one of the things that we see is when the techs go in to set up your DTX studio, they'll change some settings and they'll make some defaults. I would encourage you to undo those defaults. Um, for me, you know, to have a nice crisp bite wing or periapical is one thing, but when we have too much crispness, which is actually a filter, um, it gets in the way with the 3D imaging, in my personal opinion. Now, it may work really, really well for you. But for me personally, I would encourage you to go in and undo the defaults or just tell them when they're installing it to leave an unfiltered image uh, to get imported into DTX Studio. It, it'll make a little more sense here when we go through, but let me show you a comparison. So the top is unfiltered. Um, I've adjusted the level in the window. Level is brightness and window is contrast. Uh, depending on the density of the patient's face, um, this may vary a little bit, uh, but I would encourage you to leave it more like this than like this. And there's a reason for that. Um, the, the more processed, the more crisp, which is the filter they like to use, 
it creates these dark spots, which can be misleading. Um, and when we're when all we're looking for is a widened dark spot of a PDL, that crisp filter creates these extra dark spots. So there's a case in point, um, and I didn't put any pictures on there. <clears throat> Our first day with a CBCT, we took one of my um, dental assistant, right? And she had an implant in number, what was it, 30? Uh, and I hit this crisp filter and it was just black all the way around the implant, everywhere I saw it, right? And number one, there's probably some beam hardening happening there. But number two, the filter really um, manipulated it so that it looked very, very, very bad. And I even told Joe, Fel Joe Feldstein, I found a failing implant on my dental assistant. Yeah, there was nothing wrong with that implant. Fortunately, we didn't do anything. We took a PA and I'm like, whoa, this looks absolutely perfect and bite wings and we probed and everything was fine. So just make sure you're not over processing your images, which can get in the way of how things ultimately will go for you. Um, and you can adjust it later on. So let me show you where to get to that. Um, this is DTX Studio. Your office name will be here. When you click on the menu button, you get a little settings up here. You click on that go to image settings and I turn this on right here. I don't want them to look like this. I want them to look unfiltered, totally unfiltered and turn off all these image filters. Now, if you change any of that, it'll tell you to restart the program before you open it up, which is fine. But that's my personal preference. Okay, let's go through clinical assessment. <clears throat> so this is the sheet I, I would imagine most of you will spend most of your time on, um, clinicians that is, as you're learning to read these. Um, this is very, very helpful and it's really, really well put together. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time now, um, but I would encourage you to refer to this sheet. It's fantastic. It's amazing. It's well done. And all these are clickable links. Um, one thing to bear in mind, you should not be diagnosing decay only from a 3D x-ray. There's this thing called beam hardening that I mentioned um, that will dramatically enlarge the size of a cavity and maybe even create ghost cavities. So if you see something that looks like decay on a 3D x-ray, follow it up with a PA or a bite wing. Always, always, always. Don't rely on the 3D um, to do uh, your decay diagnosis. Uh, make sure that you're following it up to confirm. And one of the things that I've started to do as well um, is to confirm endo diagnosis as well. If you think you have a necrotic pulp that's on the, it's questionable, um, confirm it. You know, cold or electronic pulp testing or whatever you like to do make sure you're confirming your diagnosis and, and indicate that what you've done in the uh, clinical notes. Okay, so I'm gonna walk you through just real quickly kind of my diagnosing process. Basically, I'm gonna go through each of the fields of view and I'm gonna scan all the way forward and all the way back like I'm walking through the arch. And then I'm gonna go to the opposite arch and go all the way forward and all the way back. So basically I'm coming forward and back, forward and back twice. And as I'm going through these images, see this is me telling you I'm starting on that upper right. Um, I'm just gonna cycle through and, and bear in mind that I'm just demonstrating the pathway here, not necessarily digging deeply into um, the diagnosis process. Because what you'll end up doing as you're going through this um, is you'll find a spot and you'll use the uh, select tool, hit the space bar, and you'll be able to zero in on that tooth. And it'll pull it up in three different views and you can move it around and evaluate from different points of view and add filters and turn off filters. Um, so what I did is I went around all the way to the front of the image and all the way to the back on that upper left. And then I start down at the bottom left, come all the way around and then go back down to the bottom right. So here I am hopping over to the lower, so I've come forward and backward. And, and what I'm doing here is mostly looking at the apices of the roots. Um, this particular view is helpful because it gives us, you know, it's a coronal view through. It's a view that you can't see from a PA or from a pano. It's fantastic. So once I've done the coronal view, I'm going to look at the sagittal. Um, and it should be noted uh, that you can adjust the orientation of the image. So if you've got a patient that took the x-ray and they're crooked like this, you can go in uh, and edit that x-ray so that they're straight. So don't forget to do that. Now you can see there's some sinus inflammation. There's probably a periapical abscess there on tooth number three. Um, we're not really gonna look at that right now. We're just still looking at pathway. Um, but this is a less filtered image. Now, could I add some filters? Absolutely. Um, there are some ghost images you can see there and that's movement. So that's from patient movement. Fortunately, it didn't really get too much in the way of the diagnosis for this patient. Um, but the more you can encourage your patients to hold still, the better. 
Um, so once we've done the sagittal, we're going to look at the axial. Now it's important with the axial that you go all the way down to the bottom of the image and all the way up to the top a couple of times to evaluate for anything that's abnormal. And we will oftentimes see right in the center here, we'll oftentimes see carotid calcifications. They kind of end up in here. And sometimes you can see little sparkles. You can also see really, really well tonsil stones. Um, but this is the image that most people associate with an MRI. So you see people, you know, MRIs, whatever. So for that reason, many, many dentists call this a dental MRI. Now, technically it's very different, right? But for intents and purposes, explaining it to a patient, that's a good way to look at it. I usually tell patients it's a 3D image, you know, um, but the dental MRI works just fine. Okay, now I think you'll find this 3D volumetric view, this one here, um, is the least helpful for us, but the most impactful for patients sometimes. Um, we'll talk about it later, later on in the presentation, um, but really what we wanna do is make sure that we're allowing patients to see what we see, giving them an opportunity to understand it. Okay, so this is cycling. Now, now we've taken a 3D x-ray. I mentioned, uh, you know, if you have OS needs or um, ortho needs or perio needs, if you take a 3D, you can now create a two-dimensional pano or a cephalometric. So let me walk you through that process real quick. So here's the same patient. It's still filtered, but we're going to create a 3D pano. It's really pretty simple. Um, you click on the 3D pano. Now we're going to adjust and move the patient around. Um, if you want to enlarge it, you can. I normally don't. Uh, but right now we're on the pan tool, so I can actually move the whole thing up and down, left and right. Now, if the patient's oriented wrong or need to rotate along the axial plane, you can do that. So notice I'm, or I'm rotating it coronally, and now we're going to rotate it axially. So as you move that cursor up and down, it gives you different rotation options. And the same thing on the, the screen on the right. <clears throat> so there's the axial rotation, and we have the sagittal rotation here. So just bear in mind that you can adjust and position that. You don't necessarily have to. The software gets smarter and smarter um, just to make sure that you've got it. Okay, so we have a question. Are you doing anything in particular to get the TMJ every time? We try to lift the head up a little bit more so the TMJ is not missed. This is our biggest miss. Yeah, I'll mention that here in just a second. So once we, we've gotten to that, uh, gotten past the positioning, we're now going to select the, the teeth. And it's, it'll walk you through it. Um, important to note, though, is you see all the lines there? That's from metal restorations and movement, or zirconia, anything really dense. So sometimes you can't get past that. Um, and you see here, we did not get the TMJs, uh, like you're referring to, Dr. Patel. Um, now, I can go in and edit this. Um, so I'm going to cut, cut that back a little bit so we don't see all that. I don't need to see the mastoid process back there. Um, yeah, that's a decent image positioning. Now you can move in and out, make sure the anterior, sometimes they look stretched. So if you pull them back in a little bit, it'll look a little more panoramic-like. Now realizing this right now is unprocessed, it's just a slice through that uh, focal trough uh, of the CBCT. So when you're finished, I would encourage you always to use the crisp filter on this image, right? Um, so we're gonna go down to the lower right, click on that arrow and turn on the crisp. And for this image, I'd turn it almost all the way up, right? So that'll clarify that image. Can you see the difference? It's pretty dramatic. Many, many people don't know how to get to that. It takes a little while to find it. And once they find, found it, they're like, oh my gosh, this is the best thing ever. Um, so for, for TMJs, uh, if you're intentionally taking a TMJ or if you wanna make sure you're evaluating the TMJ, um, I would make sure that you, you're positioning the patient such that the occlusal plane is in the center of the field of view. Um, one of the problems that we sometimes have is that it's not. So here's a, uh, okay, we're cycling over. Sorry, I thought it was going to go into the next video. Um, so the, the real key, let me pause this so it's not too distracting. The, the real key with the TMJ positioning is looking at where those lines are. Um, and you can tilt the patient's chin up a little bit, and that's fine. What, what I usually end up noticing is the, the bottom line is gonna cut part of the chin off. That's usually the problem. We end up getting the line a little too low. When we want a TMJ, you'll end up bringing that up a little bit. So look for those lines being a little bit uh, you know, right under the eye. Um, but you'll almost always have a little distortion um, in your TMJ areas, which I'll show you here in just a second, just from the positioning um, of, 
of the machine and how it exposes. There's nothing you can do to get around some of that uh, distortion. Okay, so we generated a 3D piano. Let's generate a Ceph. Um, now this is a limited Ceph. Um, it's only eight millimeters high, but here's the Ceph that the computer did for us. Um, I'm going to add that same filter. I'm going to adjust some of the windows and the, the levels, you know, the lightness and the contrast. Um, and you can get with your orthodontist and ask them, him or her, you know, what, what do you like and is this sufficient for you? Now, this one wouldn't be. They like to see the TMJs. Um, but you can see if we would have put the, the line here instead of where it was under the chin, that whole frame would have shifted upward. So we definitely would have been able to get the TMJ and it looks like he was leaning forward a little bit. So good positioning and, and good supervision of the assistants, especially the less experienced ones will go a long way. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about annotating images and screen grab. So I just did a screenshot and you can see the screenshot button right up here. You screenshot it, it goes here. If you hit save, that'll now show up on the DTX landing page. So you don't have to open the 3D image software to get to it. Um, so here's that previous panel we created. Let's just say I want to annotate it. I want to indicate something. Now, he's a patient we're talking about all on fours. So one other thing that I could do in the future is I could actually export it to the implant software and plant some implants. Um, but you see, I took a screenshot. Now we're going to go to the screenshot itself. This is just a static screenshot. And then I can annotate that without being too worried. Now, could I annotate this? Yes. But then every, every image is going to show the annotations, um, all the other images. So go back to recent images. Then you can draw, you can, you know, do whatever you want to do. Um, and you can change these colors. Um, unfortunately, Cabo defaults to this yellow color that you see. Uh, however, you can change the colors afterwards. My oral surgeon got really frustrated when he, when we were annotating in yellow. He's like, I need it to be red. <laughs> and so you can go in and, and edit it. If you click on that bottom right arrow, once you get an annotation, you click on the annotation and you edit it. But the arrows are helpful, the little circles are helpful. Um, and so this is something that after I annotated it, I would actually print it off and give it to the patient if I needed to. Now, for some docs, they're gonna go through and identify and annotate everything, whether it's medical legal reasons or what have you, um, whatever you're comfortable with. But yeah, there are a lot of tools that you've got. All right, let's talk about printing orientation. So let's say we've got a bunch of annotations that we like. Um, when you hit print, if you're on Windows, chances are it's going to default to A4 size paper, which is frustrating. I would also encourage you to turn off the anonymized patient data if you're giving it to them so they can see their name. Now, for me, it pops up on my MacBook. It looks like it's going to work just fine. But here in the office, um, when I hit print, it's going to default to A4 paper. So you have to change it to letter, otherwise it'll get hung up in your printer. Um, that's a bug that the manufacturer is working on. All right. So that's how you print it um, from the upper left, and you can print that right there. Okay, let's talk a little bit about TMJ since we talked about it a moment ago. So here you can see we've got added the panoramic to the image set, but you can go to layout like I'm showing you and turn it on or off. Um, if you like it on there, my partner here loves it um, on there. It's a little bit easier for him to, to jump to teeth and that's fine. There are a bunch of different settings here, but if you wanna create a TMJ study, and you just click on TMJ, you know, just like we clicked on Pano, and then it's going to walk you through a couple of steps. This is all assuming you have the TMJ captured in the film. If you don't, if you, you cut off the, you know, the head of the condyle, then it's not going to be helpful at all. So what I'm doing here is I'm just tracing where that condyle is. So you can see the coronoid process and the condyle coming up, and there's the head of the condyle right here. So it wants us to mark the center of the right mandibular condyle, and then we could just go right over here, but I like to go back here and, and move it up and down a little bit to confirm where I'm at. Because sometimes when you've taken that exposure, the patient's at an angle a little bit. And so the condyles may not be at exactly the same height, but then you can adjust it up and down, left and right. Um, usually what I like to do is, is just imagine that dot right in the center of the ball, three-dimensionally in the center of the ball of the condyle. <clears throat> And then when you hit done, it'll create a nice process set of images for you, which you can go through and adjust. But you'll notice this streaking. I spent lots of time with Cavo going through calibration after calibration after calibration, trying to eliminate this streaking. You can't. It's, and it's not an issue with the machine. It's, a, it's an issue with the field of view. 
if we had gone for the, instead of the eight by 15, so eight centimeters, if we had gone for the 13, then that streaking would be at the top of the 13. So it would be out of the field of view of the TMJs. But because of the way the 3D exposes, that streaking always happens. Now there is an option, um, which you may have enabled Dr. Patel, or they may have enabled for you that actually cuts all the streaking off. So it's a black line. Um, in which case you'd miss all of this. Um, so I actually, our, uh, our service tech was logged in and he's like, I think I can fix that streaking and he turned it off. And then I was like, oh my gosh, put back the streaking. I need the streaking um, because with the black line, it literally just eliminates any of that. So you get kind of a curve at the back of, and then the rest is a cylinder. So the streaking, unfortunately, can't do anything about at the top of the image set. Okay. So airway, some of you are interested in looking at airway with uh, obstructive sleep apnea appliances. Um, we have a fantastic function here in the software. If you get the 1.8 version, you click on the airway and then it asks you to outline the, the breathing column. This is an interesting patient because he's got significant obstructive sleep apnea and he uses a CPAP, but I couldn't convince him to look at a, an OSA appliance. So it'll calculate the cylinder for you. Now realizing this is not in a sleeping position, this is in a standing position and it might be a compressed position. So this isn't diagnostic, but it's indicative of some potential problems. So you can see the colors. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually clip the face, the sagittal side of that um, image off so you can actually see, but that's within that little rectangle. The machine actually uh, you know, identifies the narrowest area the most constricted area, which is yellow, um, and then tells you based on that little sliding scale on the right side, what the most constricted areas are, you know, gives you an indication. And so this to a patient, for them to see, oh my gosh, I'm breathing only through that little cylinder, that little column, um, is really eye-opening for them. And if you've got the connections with a, you know, a sleep position or if you've got um, some training and can do a take-home sleep study like a Zephyr, which I know there's some docs out there that are doing. Dr. Spooner does that a lot, as my understanding. Um, then uh, take the ball and run with it. Um, so this is not diagnostic. This is an indication. It's a reference. Um, you can't say, oh, you have obstructive sleep apnea just based on this alone. Um, you have to go through the sleep study. Okay. So yes, I, I love this because it's super duper helpful. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, how some of these things can benefit and bless the lives of our patients. Okay, so how are we doing? Everybody doing okay so far? Anybody asleep? We've got about nine minutes left before I've got to let you all get to work or something. So a couple of things I'll show you here. Let me move my head out of the way so I can see it. So one of the things that's most critical um, in my mind that I mentioned at the beginning is um, you know, the ability that we have to help our patients see what we can see on PAs sometimes, um, now they can see in three dimensions. Um, and you can show them in different angles, you can show them in different ways. Um, you know, the daily XP, this is today's daily XP, it happened to be very apt. Um, help patients get to yes with CBCT. We, we, when used to help patients understand their treatment choices, CBCT is an effective tool for case acceptance. Recently, a new patient visited 134 East Oaks uh, dental group in, in Thousand Oaks, California, where she received a CBCT scan. The image showed a large abs abscess on number two. After reviewing the scan with the clinician, the patient agreed to treatment that very same day. Now, I want to see the PA is what I want to see. We could probably still see the abscess, but seeing it like you see it here is amazing. It's mind-blowing. Now, remember how I mentioned when you're making your panos that you can adjust the pano track a little bit? So this looks like we could have adjusted it down here. It's a little bit dark on this panel, meaning that that field of view was probably out too far, in too far, so it sectioned it out. But look at the visibility that we have of that abscess. It's really pretty amazing. Um, here are a couple from my clinical practice that I just pulled in. Um, this is from November last year. I don't have a date on that one. But look at that abscess. You know, this is almost certainly a vertical root fracture here. Um, we had treatment planned her for an extraction, but it's perforated through the buccal plate. Um, this is amazing um, how, how clear it is. So one of the things that you'll hear from Joe Feldstein, um, if you've talked to him about CBCT at all, is ask the patients, do you see that? So you'll, you'll sit him down, you'll pull up DTX diagnose, and you'll pull this up, and you can manipulate the image, and you can get it to exactly where it's the most clear. And 
and say, look at this big dark, dark spot around this tooth. This indicates you have a really large active infection around the tooth root. Can you see that? You know, and if you say it the right way and you're not manipulative and you're not deceptive, then the patients are like, yeah, yeah, I see that. And then if you can wait, if you can be patient, give them time to think about it, usually the next step is, what do we need to do about that? You know, the patient will ask, what do I need to do about that? So that opportunity for them to see what we see and then for them to take the next logical step dramatically helps to improve case acceptance. Um, but we're not shooting for case acceptance just for the sake of case acceptance. It's for healthier and happier patients. So it's really critical to bear that in mind. Our purpose here is not to focus on ADP. It's not to focus on dollar signs. It's to focus on people. And the more you focus on people and what's in their best interest, the more everything else will follow. But I'd encourage you to keep that in mind that these, um, the purposes, the processes that we have in place here, especially with 3D, enables patients to see more clearly. Of course, we can see more clearly, but enables patients to see more clearly so they can accept treatment that they need that's life-saving. Um, you know, all the bacteria from um, periapoglapsis gets directly into the heart and can cause heart attacks. You know, there's study after study after study. This bacteria is so bad for you. So being able to help people understand that visually is great. Okay. Carotid calcifications. Um, this is a gentleman um, who is in a pretty high level management position. Um, you know, he's one of the guys like many of us who feel like I don't need to see any physicians or I don't need to, you know, I'm healthy, I'm good. He's in real fit, really good shape. Um, incidental finding on a 3D x-ray. Oh yeah, you have a whole bunch of carotid calcifications on the right side. Now I can't diagnose carotid calcifications. I'm not a cardiologist, right? But I can say you have what looks like carotid calcifications on your right side. I would encourage you as soon as possible to follow up with your primary care physician or your cardiologist. This could be something that indicates a, life, a potentially life-threatening issue. Um, now, oftentimes it doesn't, but for us to be able to see now into the patient's you know, carotid arteries is mind blowing. Um, and I'd encourage you, if you see something, say it, you know, I hate to say that if you see something, say something, but if you see something that you think may be something, you're always better off sharing it with a patient, giving them an opportunity to do some further investigation. Um, and it's also helpful to make some connections um, with a cardiologist or so, um, so that when the time comes to refer, because you're seeing sinus issues, you can connect it with an ENT um, and you can also connect with cardiology or whoever. And plus those doctors will probably bring you cookies at Christmas time. Um, okay, so let's look at one more case, couple of pathology cases for you. So this is a gentleman on the left side, um, had a soft tissue lesion. It looked to me like an irritated, like denture epulis, uh, kind of right along the, uh, you know, the height of his lower right mandible there. He had been wearing dentures for a while, right? Um, so just looked irritated to me. And so, you know, we adjusted the denture. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah that doesn't hurt anymore. That feels better. Um, but then I felt like I should take a 3D. And so we took the 3D. Um, and this, the dates are backwards. This is not February of 2020. This is December 2nd of 2020. Um, there's a giant soft tissue lesion, huge. So after taking this 3D, I didn't send it to beam readers. I sent it to the oral surgeon and they took a biopsy and then they resected most of his jaw. Um, he hasn't communicated exactly what it was. I haven't seen him for a follow-up, um, but something like this gives us a really clear window in to a patient's you know, oral health. Uh, so it's really helpful to be able to give this information. I printed this off and I sent it with him to the oral surgeon and they immediately snapped a biopsy and, and he, was, he was off to the races. Fortunately, he's healing, he's recovering. Um, when he comes back, we're gonna probably have to make him a new denture um, if I could talk him into a couple of implants, but he smoked, I don't know, two or three packs a day for 40 years. So, okay, let's look at this one on the right side. This is actually like a 15 year old patient. Now this is one of the limited situations where uh, I would take a 3D um, on a patient who's younger um, if there's something that looks a little wonky. And so we took a panoramic um, and there was some you know, darkness around the apex of tooth number, I think that's number 10, number nine. Uh, and so um, this is my associate's case. We uh, went ahead and took a 3D. And we sent that up to beam readers and beam readers says this is probably a central giant cell granuloma. Uh, so send them out to oral surgery for a biopsy ASAP as soon as possible. 
Um, so we were able to help that patient as well. Uh, and it's really, you know, we sometimes ask the question, well, can any of this be, be done without the 3D? Sure. Of course, I could get to work on a bicycle too, you know, or I could walk to work or, you know, any number of comparisons. We have the option now to bring in this amazing technology that provides us with an opportunity to, to bring our patient care up to the next level. And I think once you start using this, if you haven't already, it'll, it'll give you, you know, it'll kind of change the way you practice. Because now we're looking not just at teeth and roots, but we're looking at jawbone and structures and sinuses. And, and it's really pretty, it's pretty interesting. So my final last plug is, like I said before, um, we sometimes get stuck in the rut as dentists because of the way that we're compensated of focusing on that ADP number, that dollar sign, how much the office produced, et cetera, et cetera. But I would encourage you to focus not on that dollar sign number or the number of patients the offers produced or whatever, but on the people that are impacted by your service. You know, if we can focus on people first, people first, then in the long run, um, everything else follows. You know, if you've read the, I want to say the Go Giver, um, he talks about you know if you're driving down the road, staring at the speedometer, you're always going to get in, you know you're going to get in a crash every time. So you need to look at where you're going, which is patient service. We're focused on patient service. And the speedometer, you can look at periodically to give you an indication of how fast you're going toward patient service. So as we can focus on people, focus on good service experience, um, growing our CCX number, bringing more patients in, um, then everything else will follow. But we've got to make sure that we set our own, you know, our own issues aside and work to, to treat our patients. Um, that's all I got for you. So what kind of questions do you have? Anybody? Hope we ended not too late. Maybe everybody's asleep. <clears throat> yeah, hello, good morning. Hi. Hi, uh, this is Dr. Madea um, from Office 655. How are you, sir? I'm well. Uh, thank you for the presentation, first and foremost. Um, you bet. I, I just wanted to clarify something you said earlier. You said, did you keep your, um, did you keep your, uh, panel and you said you moved it to an, and installed the stuff in another room? I just, I yes. Yeah. So what I did is I kept the panoramic machine. Let me get back to myself. Sorry. There we are. I kept the panoramic machine. Um, we just moved it across the hallway to the other room. So we have two pano, two machines that are capable of taking panos basically. Now, if you get a good trade in and you don't think you're going to use it, that's fine. You know, my office is a super busy office, so we're always better off um, having an extra machine. But in the future, if I would were to have it to do over again, because we have two x-ray bays, one's larger, one smaller, I would have left the panoramic when ours had a CEF attachment, the old pano, I would have left that there and I would have put the new 3D x-ray machine in the smaller x-ray room oriented coming out of the corner rather than on one of the walls. So, I mean, you can attach it on the wall and then orient it out a little bit um, because it's a big machine, um, but that way, you know, it would have been just out of the way a little bit. Now we can take x-rays from each operatory, you know, periaprils and bite wings, but I would suggest that probably would have been a little better, but it, our situation works, but we did keep it. Our, our unit's a few years old and we had a really low ball trade-in offer, so we kept it. All right. And then just to clarify, you have to install this image onto DTX or does it automatically do it for you? For you? So, um, uh, maybe, maybe clarify that question one more time. I'm not quite um, The image from, after you take the CBCT, oh. you have to, I guess, export it into D, uh, DTX or does it kind of... No, so it'll do it for you. When you oh. take the x-ray, um, you, you'll actually, instead of acquiring it from CPS or CDR or uh, whatever other image software there is, you'll actually open up DTX and capture it through DTX. So once you hit capture, it'll enable the machine itself. You go in and put in all your settings, get the patient in there, do the exposure. And then it takes, you know, three to five minutes. Once it processes it, then it automatically shows up in DTX Studio. So the image is there, but just like in, at least in CDR, when we double click, it'll, it'll open up in a separate window. When you open the image file from DTX Studio, it opens it up in DTX Diagnose. So it's already there. You don't have to do any work around or anything. Um, it just automatically pulls the image in. Okay. I guess and my final question is, mm -hmm. I, as you were saying, when your new patients come in, you take the um, the CBCT, a couple of panels, and uh, and image all pictures. Now, of course, like just say I'm just as an expert, like say 
as far as like a oh you get an RI uh, in PDS terms. Are you do you take the individual PA later on, or are you just copying and paste a um, an image from the CBCT? Yeah. So if, if we get an RI for a CB for a PA, um, normally if it's a pre-op, you can just do a screen screenshot. I mean, it's super easy. Just screen capture a little clip if you need it. Um, the software, when we went through the training, our trainer basically told us if you're taking a 3D x-ray and a set of bite wings, you need to create all these individual little PAs. And so I told my team, I don't want you to waste 20 minutes per patient creating snapshots of all these PAs. We'll create one if we need one. Now, if we end up needing to do an endo, um, our protocol is we bring the patient in, we take an immediate pre-op x-ray, uh, pre-op PA, uh, conventional PA. Um, we have a nomad, so it's really super easy to sit the patient in there, pop, we got the pre-op x-ray. Um, and then what I've done in, in, ahead of time is I've, I've used the 3D to determine how many canals there are and exactly where they are. So now I have a, you know, a pathway to go. But yeah, I, if we need an RI, it's super easy to go in and, uh, and screen snap a PA from it. It's, it's not hard. Thank you very much. You bet. I'll see you on the side. All right, what other questions? Hi, this is Dr. Chang from um, 644. Um, so I, I mean, I don't know if you have time to go over this, but um, it, can you touch on that implant again? So if I were to plan an implant in a spot mm -hmm. in, you know, in an area, am I transferring it to another, the DTX implant software? Yeah, so let's see. I don't know if I have that. Up. Let me see if I can pull up the studio and show you. Um, it's linked through DTX Studio. Sorry. Okay. Two screens here. Let me see if I can show you. Um, it's still trying to load. But the short answer is uh, yes. You, so you, you go to the patient name. There's a search on the left side. You pull up the patient's name. And then you have a bunch of options on the right side of that screen. And so one of them is open an implant. So you click on that, it automatically pulls the 3D image file into the implant software. Um, and that's something that I've just started to, to look at. I've always placed my implants without a guide, um, but being able to treatment plan them, you know, if we're gonna do an all on four or something, that's a little different. Um, but yes, it's really simple. There's a bridge from DTX Studio directly to DTX Implant. And those should all be installed as well. Okay, and DTX Implant is where you're opening it up or you're opening it up on Studio first? So the studio is the main, you know, kind of the mothership, if you will. Uh, and then there are different, um, I don't remember what they're called, but there are little different programs that attach to it. So you'll have DTX Studio on every computer in the office, and then you'll have DTX Diagnose, which comes with Studio also on every computer in the office. And then the implant software you can have installed on several computers. There are actually a couple of other ones as well, um, but you, we won't necessarily need to use those. But yeah, so, so the DTX Studio is linked to all the other softwares that you have installed. So you don't have to do any, anything but click on the button. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, how are we doing? Any other questions? Okay. okay. I guess everybody's asleep. No, I'm just kidding. Um, well, I sure appreciate uh, taking the time out of your day. If you need to get a hold of me, I guess I didn't put this on there. I'm at Office 809. Um, my my email is dave.king at pacden.com, dave.king at pacden.com. Um, but feel free, if you have any questions, send me an email. You know, I respond to emails just like I respond to texts. So let me know. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Michael, Dr. anything else you need for me? Yeah, go ahead. Um, thank you for the presentation. It was uh -huh. excellent. Um, I was wondering as far as moving your panel, although I can't do that anymore, um, uh, did you just move it into an operatory and did you have to rework your wall and whatnot or was so we, it simpler? So we moved our panel into another x-ray room. We have two x-ray bays. Got it. And the other x-ray bay just had a, a, one of the swivel chairs for taking you know, intraorals. Um, so we moved it into the corner uh, of the other x-ray base. So we still have the chair, we have the pano. It, it was interesting though, because I was told by three or four people that it's not gonna fit, it's not gonna work, you can't do that. Yeah. But when Patterson showed up, I, I told them what to do and they did what I wanted them to do. Um, Perfect. So I wish I did that. <laughs> yes. 
Yeah, it, yeah. And so they did have to install a backing um, ahead of right. time for the pano to be on the wall, and it worked just fine. It's it's a smaller room, but I've found my experience is if if you put your foot down, as an owner doctor, they'll listen to you usually. Uh, I did have to partner with my RP to make sure that we were we were on board. Um, you know, I wasn't trying to do something stupid, uh, but it was fine. So. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Well, I will. Uh, I'll post this on uh, my YouTube channel, which is Dave King DDS, um, and I'll maybe I'll Michael. I have you send it out if you want to. So if anybody wants to review it, uh, let me know. Um, anything else I can do for you today? No, I will forward that link uh, once okay. you send it to me. So thank you so much.